Good morning. Good morning. Please take your seats. Uh, good Saturday morning. Um, regular participants to this conference know that we usually only have two invited speakers. But this year we thought that we use this opportunity that uh, this amazing people are coming to this big conference that we use them as speakers for the, for, the, for the conference as well. So, so this year we have a third invited speaker who will be Susan Gelman. Uh, Susan Gelman is well known uh, for various different topics that she did research on. Probably most of you know uh, her work on psychological essentialism and its role in, in children's conceptual development. But of course her work uh, goes well beyond that, uh, generally on conceptual development, beyond natural kinds, uh, to uh, artifacts, to social categories, to concepts of individuals in which history plays uh, a, an important role. Uh, and, uh, uh, and also uh, she did incredible work on the role of language, that language plays in the conceptual development of of, of children, the language that adults use, uh, from very simple things like just simple label, how, how much a label uh, can contribute to uh, uh, how, how infants and, and children under, uh, understand uh, uh, adults' concepts, the concepts that they, they, the, the culture around are used. Uh, but uh, uh, what I most admire in, in her work is, is, the, uh, is the, the work on the role that generic language plays in, in uh, uh, children's uh, understanding of the concepts that adults use there, which have, of course, uh, far-reaching consequences uh, in terms of social categorization and so on. We heard uh, some of that, at least those of you who were there at, at, at Marjorie's talks. So uh, the speaker today is Susan, Susan Germann. Please welcome her. Thank you for that really generous introduction. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak. It's really been such a fantastic conference. I wish I would have been able to come to all of the um, BCCCD uh, <laughs> meetings. Uh, usually it conflicts with the beginning of our semester, but fortunately I'm not teaching this semester, so I can be here. It's just amazing uh, what you have done here. I saw the labs yesterday. Uh, I'm very, very <laughs> envious and in admiring um, of what you have built. Um, so thank you for being here. So um, what I want to do today is give you sort of a broad overview of uh, a few different research themes that I've been working on uh, over the past number of years, um, but also to put them under uh, a larger umbrella. So um, I want to start by reminding you that as adult humans, we have this amazing ability to see the visible world in terms of underlying non-visible constructs. So if you look at these pictures, um, you see bananas, children, the night sky, a glass of water, uh, but you're also capable of a construal that goes beyond those simple labels. So you can see these in terms of uh, DNA, patterns of neural activation, gravitational waves, or the molecular structure of matter. So how is it that we're able to do this? Uh, what, what is it in our um, cognitive capacity that allows us as adults to uh, construct these, these kinds of concepts. Now, um, there's a standard answer. Uh, sometimes I think of this as a stubborn answer because it, it arises again and again uh, over uh, generations. Um, so the field keeps returning to this idea that knowledge is constructed sort of bottom-up out of these sensory perceptual primitives. Uh, 
Um, and of course, this is a familiar idea that other people, uh, even in this conference, have touched on, but the British empiricists, Piaget, and many others um, sort of start with that as, as the starting point. And certainly we know that perceptual and sensory experiences are very, very important, and we know from a lot of research over the past uh, decades that even infants uh, are very sophisticated in using sensory and perceptual information and uh, aggregating over it, detecting patterns, learning statistical regularities, and so forth. So I don't mean to uh, diminish the importance of, of these sorts of experiences. But what I hope to do in the time that I have this morning is to convince you that non-obvious and abstract concepts are central in early thought. Now, um, I'm not going to be making claims about developmental beginnings or what's innate, um, so I have a more modest goal, which is to focus on the concepts of uh, language-capable children, uh, preschoolers, about three and four years of age, in some cases, uh, a bit younger than that. And I will argue that these are non-obvious abstract concepts are really core to the kinds of concepts that children, preschool children, are using in a vast array of ways of conceptualizing the world. And in fact, I want to go one step further and say not just that they're capable of doing this, but that in many cases, it's actually very difficult for them not to do this, to think about uh, their world strictly in terms of uh, concrete here and now perceptual um, entities that, that uh, they're confronted with in the moment. Um, so hopefully by the time I'm done, you'll, you'll see what I mean about that. And I've structured my concepts, uh, my comments, sorry, in terms of two levels of representations, um, kinds and individuals. So indi individuals are those uh, entities that we can see and grasp, a microphone uh, that's right here in front of me. It's a bounded entity. Um, and kinds are the categories that we place individuals into. So I'm going to be like hammering on this one theme throughout the whole talk, which is that children's representations, whether they be of kinds or individuals, um, extend beyond the obvious in quite basic but important ways. So that's, that's the take home message. Um, so I'm going to offer evidence from three lines of research. Uh, and you can think of these as three case studies. So when I talk about kinds, I'll talk about psychological essentialism, as Gergo mentioned, and also uh, some of my work on generics. And when I talk about individuals, I will focus on object history as a non-obvious component of how children think about individuals. OK, so let me start with essentialism. And here I'm kind of borrowing liberally from an example that Marjorie used in her talk, um, only mine's a wolf instead of a tiger. Um, so one intuition that we have about natural categories is that they have an underlying hidden essence. Um, so you see this adorable little wolf pup. Uh, you just want to like hug it and take it home. But you don't do that, because you know that it's going to grow up to be a ferocious beast that would have no qualms about killing you. Um, so even if it looks completely innocent, even if it's raised by humans, even if it were to wear sheep's clothing, uh, it has an innate predisposition that's going to win out no matter what. Um, so we can graph it out like this. Um, so if that rectangle is your concept, um, it includes observable outward features that you can learn but there's also a belief that there are deeper features um, that are linked to those outward features, and moreover, that there's some sort of causal something 
uh, we can call it the essence. It gives rise to both the observable and the unobservable features. And I should point out that that essence would typically be, uh, certainly for children and even often for adults, a placeholder concept. It's not actually filled in with detailed content about what that causal something is, just a belief that there is something. And then that may get filled in later with uh, particular content. Um, you know, people might have beliefs that blood is critical or DNA or something like that. Now, um, psychological essentialism uh, has a positive side for sure. It seems to motivate the search for um, underlying truths about the world. Um, and certainly our categories can capture all kinds of um, regularities uh, that are surprising. We can learn new things about the world with this belief that there's actual structure there. So all of these are examples of uh, ways in which we classify things in a way that goes beyond appearance. So like, you know, the legless lizard, the stick insect, the, um, uh, the pyrite, which is called fool's gold, and so forth. Um, at the same time, I think it's very important to point out that essentialism is also a cognitive bias. Um, it oversimplifies. It can lead to misconceptions about race. Um, this was from a study doing a, a national survey in the US uh, about beliefs about genes. And most people, most Americans agreed with this statement that two people from the same race will always be more genetically similar to each other than two people from different races. That is clearly false. Um, uh, clear to someone who is knowledgeable, but not clear to the, to the average person. So that's an example of essentialism overextending. Um, and then also artificial distinctions, such as caste or um, uh, social class and so forth. They're sometimes considered to be uh, biologically based, immutable, and so forth. Um, and I'm, I'm not gonna get into it now, but there are some uh, very interesting lines of research also looking at how essentialist beliefs lead to misconceptions in the uptake of scientific evidence. So even when people are informed about things like evolutionary theory or genetics, um, it gets kind of warped and misinterpreted uh, through an essentialist lens often. And there's very good research on that. Okay, so for many years now, to, to indicate many years, I'm putting my book up because that was published uh, about 15 years ago. I've been arguing that essentialism is a basic conceptual bias. So children are little essentialists. So just very quickly, uh, review a few of the findings um, from my lab and other people's labs, which is the basis of why um, I, I've argued this. So preschool children treat categories as immutable, so even if you transform a raccoon to look just like a skunk, it's still a raccoon. They say that categories have an underlying reality so a legless lizard will have the same insides as a regular lizard, even if it looks more like a snake. They say that nurture uh, is trumped by nature. So uh, a baby rabbit raised by monkeys is going to grow up to like carrots and be good at hopping. And they say that insides have uh, a causal force. So if a child considers swapping hearts with a pig so that they would have a pig's heart inside of them um, rather than a human heart, they, would, they believe that they would end up acting and feeling just a bit more like a pig. Um, and by the way, this is not just children. So about a third of heart-lung transplant recipients, adults, report the same belief. Um, and these are not just data from the US. So what I've done here is, this is not an exhaustive map, but um, I, I put like a, a little pin in uh, parts of the world where research teams have studied essentialism. Um, and this represents over um, 
a couple dozen papers with over 7,000 participants. And what you see is that in all different kinds of societies, researchers have found that children and adults um, essentialize. Uh, now, I will say which categories they essentialize is quite variable. Um, but consistently, they essentialize natural kinds, types of animals and plants, um, and various social kinds, though, as I said, variable as to which social kinds. Um, however, in all of these cases, children's experiences are largely consistent with essentialist assumptions. You know, it really is the case that you never see a rabbit that, um, you know, starts acting like a human, even if it's raised by humans. Um, you know, you, there are uh, raccoons never transform into skunks and so on. Um, and even if you take something like gender, which is one of the most essentialized social categories across different cultures, again, the world seems to present a lot of evidence consistent with essentialism. Um, it does seem to be a binary world. Um, we, um, a child learns early on that the, the uh, sex they are at birth continues throughout their whole life. Um, there are a lot of predictions one can make based on a person's uh, gender and so forth. So uh, I think a really important question is what we would see if there are children whose experiences seem to challenge essentialism. Then, then what does it look like? Um, so for example, this uh, child is Jazz Jennings. This is a transgender girl who uh, was a boy at birth, um, but she insisted that she was a girl, um, and she eventually convinced her parents, socially transitioned, and um, now lives as a girl. So, you know, her experience would seem to go against uh, gender essentialism. For her, gender is not stable over time. Biology was not destiny. How would somebody like this uh, think about essentialism with regard to gender? Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some work that we're doing that's begun to look at this issue. It's still early days of the project, so um, we're continuing to, to do further studies, but I'll, I'll tell you about the uh, first couple of studies that we've done in this investigation. And this is part of a larger project headed by Christina Olson, who's up at the top left there. Um, and a collaborator on this project is Celine Gulgos, uh, who's at the bottom. And uh, Christina has been working on issues of transgender children's concepts for a number of years now. This is very difficult research to do because uh, unlike most samples that we do in developmental, you can't just you know, contact local parents and ask them to bring their children in. They have to travel around, they, they've been traveling around North America, so Canada and the US, um, almost every state, uh, to find their participants. I'm very fortunate to be um, able to collaborate with them on this project. So in this set of studies, we're interviewing children who were assigned one sex, sex at birth, but feel from an early age that their gender doesn't match. Um, and as I said already, these children provide a particularly important test case of uh, essentialist beliefs. And I want to just say uh, a brief word about terminology. So when I say transgender, uh, if I say transgender girl, that would be a child who was assigned uh, the sex of boy at birth but identifies as a girl. Uh, cisgender are children who are not transgender. So they, their gender identity matches their sex at birth. So the question here is whether transgender and cisgender children make inferences about people based on their sex at birth, uh, 
and think that gender is inborn. So these are not, that's not the full scope of how one might look at essentialism, but there are uh, a couple of important pieces, and that's where we started. So we have um, two different studies, one I'll call the island task, one I'll call the inborn task. Um, you can see information about our transgender samples. These are different groups in each study. We also have cisgender controls who are matched to the transgender children in terms of age and gender. So um, you can see, for example, that these samples were a little bit biased uh, toward girls. And then another interesting group are siblings uh, of the transgender children. So these are children whose own identity is consistent with essentialist assumptions, but who live in close contact with a, uh, a child who is transgender. Okay, so let me tell you about the island task first. Um, we would tell children about a baby. Uh, for example, this uh, could be a girl named Alex who's taken to an island to live with her uncles. And importantly, only boys and men live on this island, so Alex never interacted with another girl or woman. And after hearing about this vignette, participants were asked a series of questions about Alex's future preferences. Uh, for example, does Alex play with dolls? Does Alex play football? And so on. So there's sort of a tension between the child's uh, sex at birth and the rearing environment, which is um, sort of opposite to that. And then we also had like a uh, a boy named Chris went to live on an island with only women and girls, same setup. Uh, so I'll show you the data. Um, in this graph, anything, so the red line is uh, chance. Anything above would be an essentialist uh, kind of inference, saying that the child would have characteristics of their sex at birth. Uh, despite the rearing environment. Um, and what you see with the control participants, remember these are cisgender kids um, across a wide age range, and this is very characteristic of what other people have found, uh, which is high essentialism, especially at the youngest stage, and it drops uh, somewhat over time, but they're, they're well above chance. Uh, Pretty much the same pattern with the transgender children. Even though their own experience is different from that, they anticipate an essentialist view of, of these other children, and the same with the siblings. Okay, so now uh, the second task is gender inborn, so it kind of goes the other way. And so starting with the baby and making inferences about what they'll be like, uh, here we have a child and the kids have to make inferences about what the child was like as, as a baby. Um, so uh, here's an example of the kind of item we asked regarding gender, whether gender is inborn. Um, a kid named Andrew is a boy. Andrew likes to be called Andy. He wants to wear clothes that mostly boys wear and play with toys that mostly boys play with. Do you think Andrew was born a boy? Control participants strongly believe, and there were, there were no age effects on this task, they strongly believe that gender is inborn. Now here, we did see uh, lower rates of treating gender in an essentialist way for the transgender sample and their siblings, and both of them were lower than the control participants. So, you look at this and you can see that something about the ch children's experiences, uh, perhaps their own identity, in, case, in the case of the transgender children, perhaps living with someone with a transgender identity, in the case of siblings, um, is lowering their essentialism. Now, on the other hand, they're still well above chance. Now I want to turn to the second question, which is not about gender stability, but gender identity. 
Um, so this is very analogous to the gender question, but slightly different. A boy named Charles feels like a girl. He wants to be called Charlotte, wears clothes that mostly girls wear, and plays with toys that mostly girls play with. So here we have that uh, sort of a child-friendly description of a transgender uh, girl. And the question is not about what gender, what gender Charles was born with, but rather what, how did Charles feel uh, as a baby? Do you think Charles was born feeling like a girl? Is this essentialized, the, the gender identity? The control children were at chance, you know, slightly below. They think this is not something that's part of uh, a, a child's essence. The transgender children were quite essentialist about gender identity. Um, and the, the siblings were um, not different from the controls. So the transgender children here now take essentialism as sort of a framing and apply it to gender identity. So you can see that the uh, patterns differ as, as a function of the question. I think the bottom line here is that essentialism is a robust tendency in children, uh, but also it's a flexible, adaptable belief um, that's responsive to differential experience. Okay, so essentialism, I would say is easy to think, habit of mind, basic human predisposition, um, and that even in early childhood, concepts are not just rooted in observable features. They include this essence placeholder for a deeper level of analysis, and we see this even with children with notably different gender experiences. Okay, I'm gonna turn now to a second way that children think about non-obvious concepts, and that um, is, uh, with generic language. And my argument will be that generic language, which is ubiquitous and universal, um, rests on this notion of abstract kinds, uh, which cannot be identified in the here and now. So I want to illustrate this by telling you two facts. Okay, so fact number one. Fewer than 1% of mosquitoes in areas where the West Nile virus has been found actually carry the virus. So that would be that, like, among all of these mosquitoes, that one would, would be the one carrying the West Nile virus. Fact two, mosquitoes carry the West Nile virus. Okay, how, how could you say this? In the context of this being such a rare event, it does not, this sentence doesn't reflect ignorance, um, but instead it's telling us something important about how language works and the concepts that underlie our language. So this is known as a generic. And I will say that there's a very deep and interesting set of questions and uh, findings about generics what they mean, how they're learned, what they imply about norms and rules, how they govern our social concepts. Um, there's been important work by Marjorie Rhodes, Sandeep Prasada, Andre Simpian, Sarah Jane Leslie, uh, M.H. Tesler. Uh, for current purposes, I'm just gonna focus on one little corner of the problem, uh, which is what they tell us about the non-obvious. Okay, so generics refer to kinds. Uh, I'll give you some examples. Um, first of all, you, you find them everywhere people are trying to communicate information, such as Wikipedia. Um, they're also abundant in um, books written for children. The elephant is the only mammal that cannot jump. Uh, parents use them extensively with their children. This is how I stumbled across generics to begin with. I was looking to see how do parents convey essentialized concepts and found that they say nothing about genes or internal essence or anything like that, but they're rich with, with generics. Um, a walk is how people in China cook, was from one of our studies. We see them in every language. Uh, this is uh, from a Chinese parent to their child. Do big rats bite people or not? 
Uh, we've done some work uh, in South America and Peru with Quechua-speaking parents. Uh, what do dogs eat? And of course, children use generics as well. They start at about two and a half. This is from one of the children that Roger Brown studied. Do butterflies have bones? And if you'll indulge in me, I will give you the example. If you've ever heard me talk about generics, you will have heard this example. I guarantee uh, it's from my son, Adam, when he was two and a half. And I told him to take a nap. And he said, Adams don't have to take naps. Um, <laughs> so you can form generics. You, you can create a kind even when uh, there wasn't one prior to that. OK, so generics pose two semantic challenges for learners. One is that kinds are unobservable. And the other is that statistical cues are insufficient. Uh, so for example, if I say cheetahs run fast, I can't ever show you cheetahs. I can show you one cheetah, I could show you a thousand cheetahs, but I can't show you cheetahs as an abstract kind, past, present, future, hypothetical, potential, and so forth. It's an abstraction. Um, and in fact, uh, you can see this in how parents gesture when they're stating something generically, so we actually did this study. This is work they did with Meredith Meyer. Um, and I'm going to uh, play you a brief clip of a parent saying a specific statement and a generic statement. These were carefully controlled in terms of content. We had a little card that said what the parent was supposed to tell the child. Um, and the sound, there's no sound until the parent says the relevant statement. And then you'll hear a beep. So just observe, this is a specific clip. Okay. Now, look at the generic. And again, the beep will tell you when the parent is saying the relevant statement. And um, when we had, uh, we, we actually get the same effect with children as well. They refrain from gesturing when they're making generics. Um, again, supporting the idea that you, you can't point to a generic kind. OK. Uh, statistical cues are insufficient. So let's start with kind of a first pass through a simple model of how you might think that generics would map on to statistics, um, which would be frequency. So what percentage of the category has, has a generic property uh, from 0 to 100%. And we see that uh, a lot of generics have exceptions. So you can say birds fly, even though a lot of birds don't fly. Now, probably most birds fly, but penguins don't, ostriches don't, and so forth. You can also say lions have manes even though only male lions have mane. So here, only half the category has the property. And as I already showed you, you have examples like mosquitoes carry the West Nile virus, which are, in fact, extremely rare, yet make a, a, a perfectly fine generic. Um, now, complicating the picture even more is that each of these frequencies um, can be the basis of statements that make terrible generics that nobody would ever say. In fact, you'd probably say these are false. So people have PhDs. You know, it's a, a rare, uh, you know, relatively small percentage of humans have PhDs. Um, why can we say mosquitoes carry the West Nile virus, but not people have PhDs? Lions are male. Again, it's a bad statement. Or turtles die in infancy, even though the vast majority of turtles uh, don't survive past infancy. We also know that domain-specific theories play a role. So I'll just give you one example. Uh, there's more evidence on this. But for adults, generics privilege features of a category that emerge with development. So uh, the classic ugly duckling story, if you're familiar with that, um, swans are notoriously ugly, 
uh, when they're young and they grow up to be beautiful, but we say swans are beautiful, not swans are ugly. Um, and statistics have asymmetric influence. So what do I mean by this? So on the one hand, you can assert a generic on the basis of minimal evidence. Mosquitoes carry the West Nile virus, for example. But on the other hand, generics imply a strong link between the category and the property, and therefore high prevalence. So we get this paradoxical asymmetry where people tend to exaggerate prevalence relative to the evidence. So let me be specific. If I tell you these are crullets, I tell you that 70% of crullets have spots. Uh, we know from experimental evidence that people will, assert, will agree to the assertion that crullets have spots. But if I tell you crullets have spots, and I ask you to guess what percentage of the category has spots, people on average guess that 95% of crullets have spots. So that asymmetry between 70% and 95% is what I'm talking about here. Uh, we find this asymmetry with adults, with older children, 7 to 11, and with younger children, 4 to 5. Um, and interestingly, we do not see this with quantifiers like almost and some. I'll return to quantifiers in a minute. So this asymmetry seems like it could have real-world implications. So people may feel that they can assert generics on the basis of variable uh, evidence with a lot of exceptions. They might say sexist or racist things, like girls don't like math, knowing full well it's not always the case. But then someone hearing this, who maybe doesn't have the knowledge base, base yet, such as a child, will uh, perhaps interpret that as being generally true and, in fact, usually true. Or in political discourse, again, uh, people may make statements where they feel justified in uh, saying it generically, even when they know that full well there are exceptions, but then how it gets interpreted is different. And in scientific communication, um, this is an example, I don't mean to pick on whoever wrote this paper, but this example is um, the sort of thing you see in, in scientific papers. Socially excluded people alter the self to gain social connection. The claim here is generic, even though the authors know full well that this had exceptions in their own data. And uh, we've recently looked at generics in scientific communication, so I'm going to just do a slight detour to tell you about these data, because I'm really trying to get the word out about our own use of language when we communicate our science. This is a project with Jasmine De Jesus, Graciela Solis, Maureen Callanan, and myself. We looked at every article published in 11 psychology journals over two years, so it's about 1,100 articles and it was almost 14,000 codable elements. And we coded every statement that reported a result. Um, in the abstracts, in the highlights, and in titles. So here, here are just a couple of examples, uh, like juvenile male offenders are deficient in emotion processing. These are you know, from, from uh, our database. And just a huge range of categories of types of people and constructs uh, were genericized. These are just a few examples of the many, many ones that we saw. We found that 22% of sentences reporting results were generic, but 89% uh, of articles included at least one generic. So sometimes re results were reported specifically, but then the bottom line conclusion was generic. That was quite typical. There were more generics for articles that didn't specify participant SES. And in fact, the vast majority of articles that we reviewed uh, said nothing about the participants' race or ethnicity, socioeconomic status, or language background. Uh, generic frequency wasn't correlated with study sample size. So it wasn't, oh, if you had a larger sample, then you made more generic statements. That could be a sample of 12, could be a sample of a couple thousand. And we also found that uh, we did some experiments where we manipulated the wording, and we found that people judged 
uh, findings with generics to be more important and more generalizable. Here are the data by journal. And uh, the, what I want is, first of all, let me just say the titles, most of the titles could not be coded because they weren't statements. You, you need a, like a full statement and a verb in order to see whether it's generic or not. But that being said, that's why the error bars are bigger for the titles. That being said, uh, there's this very consistent pattern. The shorter the um, element, the more generic it was, which makes sense because if you are writing one of these highlights, you're only allowed 85 characters. You want to pull out anything that might lengthen what you're saying, and that includes all those specifying markers that you need to make something not generic. Okay. So think about that the next time you write a paper. Um, generic, so come back to the, the point here. Generic reference are unobservable. Statistical cues are insufficient, but children learn generics readily. And here, I'm just going to give a couple of quick examples. Um, this is from some work I did with Lakshmi Raman. Um, if you show children um, here and now information that sort of conflicts with the generic, you could ask them about it in a non-generic way. Here are two elephants. Now I'm going to ask you a question about the elephants. Are the elephants big or little? Um, you would predict that they would say little because that's what the evidence shows. The generic is more interesting. Um, here are two elephants. Now I'm going to ask you a question about elephants. Are elephants big or little? And here the prediction is that they will um, not report what's in front of them, but rather talk about the generic kind. And that's what we see. This is with three and four-year-olds. Uh, with the non-generic, they go with the specific response. And with generic, uh, some of the time they go with the specific response, but they're uh, also uh, likely to re reply with category information. We also have looked at those examples, that contrast I was showing you before with lines have mains, lines are male. Uh, we had a bunch of examples like that. Um, here I'm illustrating it with birds lay eggs versus birds are girls. Um, and if you ask adults, uh, we wanted to verify that they do think that about um, only about half of birds lay eggs, uh, and that's indeed what we found. But uh, five-year-olds endorse birds lay eggs as true, not birds or girls. Uh, we had a bunch of controls. So is there some problem with predicates of the form are noun, um, like birds or girls? No, they're perfectly fine with mommy birds or girls. Is there a problem with statements asserting bear, noun, bear plural noun are? No, they're perfectly fine with birds or animals that fly. Is there a problem with statements they've never heard before, like birds or girls? No, they're fine with girl birds fly, etc. Okay, now in addition to children being able to learn generics, they may even be a default mode of generalization. And here is where I'm returning to quantifiers, um, generics are distinct from specific statements, but they're also distinct from logical quantifiers, like all x's, most x's, some x's. Um, quantifiers seem to have these clear, precise, semantic rules. All means every single one. Most means more than 50%. These are very easy to articulate and to put into logical format. And yet what we see is that um, Children have a lot more difficulty learning quantifiers than generics. Um, so we've done uh, various studies where we look at how children interpret quantifiers and generics, and what you can see is that there's no change with age in the interpretation of generics. It's the quantifiers that take time to come in and that separate out over time. This is in English. The red line is, are the generics. This is in Mandarin, it's a little bit slower. Um, and this was in Quechua. Again, this is a, a more subtle pattern, but it was that same pulling apart with age. Um, and this is just another way of looking at a different data set where uh, the adults show four distinct different uh, patterns. Don't worry about the specifics of it. 
but generics show one pattern, all, most, and some are each distinct. And for preschoolers, they sort of collapse, not completely collapse, but uh, tend to collapse into the generic. We also see the quantifiers are recalled as generic. So we have uh, a task we've used where we first have a teaching block. Children see a series of pictures one at a time. They hear a statement about that picture. It's either generic or it's with a quantifier. Then there's a four minute delay. And then children see the same series of pictures and they're asked to recall. Now, um, when you provide generics, children readily recall them as generic as do adults. When you have a quantifier, most bears climb trees, for example. Um, <coughs> Three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and adults tend to recall that as generic. They don't do the reverse. They don't recall generic statements as most. All bears climb trees. See this pattern again clearly with the three and four-year-olds. And, uh, and it's there with the adults. It's just weaker. <coughs> And some bears climb trees, we see this just with the three-year-olds. So which quantifiers are getting sort of collapsed into generics gets narrowed uh, with age, but it's a pattern that you see with adults as well as children. Uh, we just had a paper recently where we also found this even with numbers. So when children heard statements like, five bears climb trees, three-year-olds recalled that as generic, but only if they did not know the number five. So we use Karen Wynn's um, uh, number task. And um, once they knew five, they didn't make that error. <clears throat> now, you may be thinking, well, in all these cases, recalling it as generic means dropping something out. Maybe it's just like a simplification. So to look at this, we did a study uh, in rural Mexico with Spanish-speaking children because uh, Spanish has this interesting quality where um, uh, in, when you form a generic, you put an article. Um, I hesitate to, to use my Spanish because my accent is so bad, uh, but los osos uh, would be, in, it's like the bears is how you would say it in the Romance languages. Um, and we, we find that, um, again, children recall generics as generics. They re recall all as generics. And of greatest interest, if you say many bears, now children can't just drop out the word muchos, but they have to swap out muchos and insert los. So you get the same effect with children and adults. OK. So generics refer to concepts that are fundamentally abstract, non-obvious, theory-laden, opposite of here and now. They are everywhere. Um, <clears throat> by the way, they're even in uh, the Pura Cha that uh, Dan Everett has studied, where he argues that they don't do anything sophisticated, but they do do generics. Um, and for preschool children as well as adults, generic language reflects theory-based knowledge and may even be a cognitive default. Now, I, I, I'm just going to take one more moment about generics before I move on to the last section of my talk. Um, and this is another really, I think, fascinating use of generics that we've been looking at for the last couple of years. And I'm going to illustrate with this quote from Kate Baller. She's a professor at Duke Divinity School. Um, she was diagnosed with incurable stage four cancer in her 30s, and she's written about how her cancer affects her faith. And this was from an interview um, where she was talking about her experiences, and she said, I don't have the luxury of being too sophisticated anymore. I mean, you just get infected with this urgency that comes with facing your death. Uh, you here does not refer to the interviewer. You here is a generic, it refers to the generic person. Uh, so she goes from an in the moment stance of her own personal experience to this generalizing um, statement about humans. And th this is uh, what is called generic person. 
all languages have generic person. How it's expressed differs from language to language, but interestingly, there are a variety of unrelated languages, including English, um, but many other unrelated languages, where the words for generic person are actually you and we. Uh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Uh, in Hong Kong, we have a special custom called yum cha that was uh, from a paper about generics. Um, and I, I think that this is super interesting, and I just want to point out three things about it. And you know, you can ask me more about it in the questions if we have, if if you're interested. But um, three points. So first, the language learning problem here is really interesting because not only does a child have to go beyond the here and now, but they have to take the very same words that are the epitome of here and now. The word you, like you. That's very specific and in the moment. And children, you know, notoriously have some difficulty with these uh, shifters. Uh, but they also have to learn that it's abstract and not in the moment at all. The second point <clears throat> is, oh, sorry, I should have put that up. Um, uh, and, and I will point out as well that children as young as two and a half are using uh, generics uh, flexibly. Second point is that people do what the, the anthropologist Jack Sidnall calls a jumping scale, where you go from specific to generic. We see this a lot with generic person references. And it, it seems to suggest, this is a rich interpretation, but it seems to suggest that even when people are talking about the here and now, those generic kinds are sort of like always available and ready to be inserted. This is an example from a, a paper in Pragmatics by Sterling and Manderson. Again, it was a very difficult uh, it was a case of someone who was very ill, where she was talking about what she has to do now to be careful. And you can see she flips back and forth between the I personal perspective and the you generic perspective. Um, and the third point is that when people shift from Specific to generic, it's not just going more general, but it's also becoming more normative and meaning-making. Um, and so this is a, 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 a wonderful opportunity to see what are the conceptual sort of consequences of going from specific to generic. <clears throat> okay, so to recap, uh, I've talked about children's representations of kinds and how they go beyond the obvious. Um, and now I'm going to shift to individuals. And now, as I said, individuals are bounded in space and time, um, but this doesn't mean that our representations are necessarily bounded in space and time. Um, and uh, to begin, there are these special objects with special history. Um, that's a bag that went to the moon with Neil Armstrong. Um, those are the part of the Elgin marbles. We collect these, we put them in museums, we pay more money for them. Uh, they could be otherwise mundane or even useless, but their history makes them real, authentic, valuable. And we have whole cultural systems in place for valuing these things. There's evidence that suggests that it's not just an association, it's not just a positive association going on, but history itself is critical. And here, uh, I like this uh, paper by George Newman and Paul Bloom, where they looked at people's um, actual bids um, for, uh, I think it was Sotheby's or something like that, where they had uh, celebrity auctions, where celebrity items were being auctioned off. And they had participants rate the degree of contact that they thought each element, each of the items for sale had with the original owner. Uh, and then they also looked at that to predict how much people paid for these items above and beyond their sort of value as an object per se. And they found that there was this benefit, the more closely tied the contact, direct contact was with the owner, um, and so I think this was JFK, um, Marilyn Monroe, those are positive, and then that was Bernie Madoff, if you'll remember him, that went negative. So the more, more likely he was to have made contact 
with the items for sale, the less they were worth, which is an interesting additional point. We see this perspective on authentic objects by about five years of age. So we did a study a few years ago where we contrasted uh, uh, items, counterbalance which item belonged to which person, and it was either uh, like a flag, for example, this was our best item to be honest. So a flag pin that was either owned by the experimenter's dad or that was owned by then President Obama. Um, on average, children said that the flag pin owned by the dad was worth $98. If you, if you want to have a very amusing time, ask a five-year-old how much things are worth. Uh, we had to log transform the values because they went up too high. Uh, for Obama, $62,657. <laughs> Maybe we'd all pay that much for his flag pin nowadays. Um, okay, and, and this was like pretty constant over the age period studied, um, though the, the number of items to which they applied this uh, got broader with as kids got older, and this is not just, they didn't value merely old items. They were the items with a special history. Um, similarly, three-year-olds prefer their original toys to objectively newer replacements. So again, history seems to matter. These are all special objects, museum pieces, celebrity possessions, beloved attachment objects. But there's reason to think that history has a much more general reach than this. Um, this is, um, I'm putting up here the cover of a book by Michael Layton, um, who argued that the ability to reconstruct an object's history might be built into our visual system. So you see that object, you can't help but think of it as a can that experienced a denting event. You don't just see it as an object in the here and now with a particular shape. The history of it is, is part of how you represent that object, uh, and we heard some um, interesting work on this um, by uh, Peltz uh, yesterday, I think it was yesterday. So my question here is how much of that history is part of the representation per se? How might we see it with children? I'm running low on time, so I'm trying to think, well, I'm just gonna try to go fast. Um, we'll see if I can get through everything. Um, I think a really good example of this are concepts of ownership. Ownership is deceptively simple, um, but um, Ori Friedman, uh, Shay Nance Cavell, and I have argued recently that ownership uh, can be construed, by, certainly by three or four years of age, um, as a theory that it interprets what is observable in terms of unobservable constructs. Um, so we argue that it has a distinct ontology, distinct causal laws, and unobservable constructs, which is my focus here. So that um, thinking about ownership requires representing an invisible link between the owner and the property, even if they're not together in time and space, and as well as an invisible link between the own object and its history. Ownership is defined in terms of its history. So we've developed a set of simple tasks to examine whether preschool children appreciate these invisible links. Do representations of owned objects include their past? Um, and we find that preschool children track invisible object history when ownership is assigned, even when not asked. So the experimenter takes three identical objects. This is mine. This is yours. Look at this. And then in some fashion or another, just jumbles them up uh, in front of the child. The child gets to see, but is not told to keep track of it. And then they're asked, which one's mine, which one's yours? And we see that um, children succeed on this task by three years of age, and even two-year-olds uh, succeed when they're asked about the self. We saw, also see that preschoolers search for non-visible traces of object history. So children see two identical objects. Um, there is, uh, they see their, their assigned ownership, this one's mine, this one's yours, and then the child's object is given a distinctive history. That, that history is either indicated with a trace that's hidden, so it's either inside or underneath the object, 
or the experimenter uh, looks as if they're giving the object history, but there's no mark whatsoever, or there's no history, and that's the control. Um, here's a kid. Is this working? Oh, well. It was cute. He, he, he scrutinized both objects. It was the invisible trace. Um, and uh, eventually he picked one. And what we see, again, we've done this with two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds. Um, <clears throat> by three years of age, they will search for the hidden trace and the invisible trace. The two-year-olds only search for the hidden trace, not the invisible trace. Preschoolers invoke invisible ties of ownership, so we have a task where children were told a series of, of stories in which identical items, which are shown, are swapped. The swap was, um, and we have, uh, there's a control where someone just borrows an object, but then the swap is either explicit, okay, let's swap the objects, or it was an accident, unbeknownst to both owners, or it was a trick on the part of one of the people. Uh, now, when you ask two-year-olds about these, they think that as long as both people still have the toy, a toy, doesn't matter. So they don't like borrowing because that means one person is temporarily deprived of the toy. But intentional swaps, accidental swaps, tricks are fine. But four-year-olds really did not like when the uh, items were swapped and they, they would give kind of extensive reasons why they thought that was not good and they should make sure to fix it. Um, okay, the last set of studies I want to mention is, uh, has to do with a special kind of object where history shouldn't matter, which is uh, money. Uh, it shouldn't matter. We don't really care. When we put money in the bank, we don't, we don't expect to get, you know, if you put a $20 bill in the bank, you don't expect to get the same $20 bill back. It's not Hogwarts. Um, but um, on the other hand, even for adults, uh, it's well established that money is not just coldly instrumental. We talk about blood money, talk about an honest dollar that was earned. We talk about laundering money. Um, and economists have found that people engage in what's called mental accounting. They keep track of what money comes from which source. And people, like, there's one study of prostitutes that found that from their day job, they would use that money for, like, buying groceries and that kind of thing. But from their night job, they would use that, the, the, those funds for things like, um, you know, luxury items and that sort. So there's this sense in which we keep track of the, the source of money, in particular its moral source, um, but we wanted to know if this moral history is actually part of the object representation. Not just money in, in terms of like the amounts, but the, the dollars themselves. And this is work that Arbor Tassimi and I have done where we basically asked adults and children about money with differing moral histories. The most important contrast is between, do you want a dollar that was stolen? Do you want a dollar that was not stolen, but it was offered by a thief who stole a different dollar? So imagine this person who has two dollars, one of which they stole, one of which they didn't stole, steal. Do you care? Do you make a difference? In some sense, does the moral history attach? And I know I'm out of time, so I'll just say, we, we ask this with very simple vignettes. We find that uh, if you ask adults, that the most important comparison, so the endpoints are just baselines. Just do you want a dollar that's like not stolen, nothing wrong with it? Do you want a dollar that someone sneezed on? That's the dirty one at the end. The most relevant is this contrast, actually, between someone who's a thief but offering you a so-called clean dollar versus uh, someone who's clean but offering you a stolen dollar. Uh, adults would much rather have the dollar from the thief. Uh, this is true when you up the amount. Um, in this case, we, you know, $100. Now they're fine with taking the, the money that someone sneezed on, okay? That's, the, that, that, the, they'll wash it, you know? But, it, but you can't wash the stolen dollar. Um, four quarters, uh, you know, I don't know how money is 
uh, in Hungary, but in the US, you can track dollars because they have like a serial number or something. And so we did quarters because they don't have that, same result. Uh, we specified no one would know because we were worried that they might think, oh, I'll get in trouble, same effect. We specified that they could not possibly get in trouble, uh, same effect. And we then finally, we asked them to recall their past history with dollars uh, or money. And we asked them, did someone ever offer you money that you felt was tainted or dirty, either literally or metaphorically? Tell us how, it, if so, tell us how it was dirty. And then if so, tell us whether you took it or not. And um, about, uh, yeah, about a third of the time, they got literally dirty money, about uh, 60 out of 300 metaphorically dirty money, so literally dirty, uh, these are kind of gross, but uh, I have been offered money out of a woman's sweaty bra. I felt that it was literally dirty. The money was wet. Um, <laughs> metaphorically, many years ago, my mother-in-law kept taking money from a dying old man with no family and tried to give some to us. Okay, the rate of acceptance, much more likely to take the literally dirty money than a metaphorically dirty money, at least in their, their recall. Okay, so what about kids? So it, it was a different scale with children, which is why it only goes up to two, uh, but that was the maximum. Um, so the older children, eight to nine, now, they were very squeamish about taking money, and they seemed very concerned about ownership. And even though, like, it, on the baseline, someone was offering their own money. Um, they typically didn't want it, and they talked about ownership a ton. However, we still see they wanted a neutral dollar more than a literally dirty dollar, and importantly, they wanted money from a thief that was a clean dollar versus a stolen dollar from a non-thief, um, and then the bad giver bad dollar was also lower. Um, what about five to six-year-olds? Now here, uh, I'm not quite sure what conclusion to draw in the sense that uh, the five to six-year-olds showed somewhat of the same effect. They certainly, they were sensitive to the task. Uh, they also showed the classic effect that we keep getting. I'm not convinced it was about moral history though because they didn't talk about moral history very much. And also bad giver versus bad giver, bad dollar was not different, and that was consistently not different across a series of studies. Um, and they seem to be really concerned with how great money is. Um, <laughs> so I feel like there might be like a little bit of something there, but it's not quite solidified. So I just have to play, I really hope this works because these are so funny. Okay, so this is um, a kid who was offered uh, a stolen dollar, or yeah, what would happen with a stolen dollar? Okay, so now I'm going to ask you a few more questions. So this is Brian. Brian stole a dollar from another person. It's in his cubby. Did Brian steal the dollar? Yeah. That's right, Brian stole the dollar. So Brian says you can have the dollar if you want. Do you want the dollar? Yeah. Do you want it a little bit or a lot? A lot. And why? <laughs> So I can buy ice cream today. Okay. <laughs> and that was very typical. Um, and, and, but they had no problem rejecting it. So this is dollar. Marvin. Marvin sneezed and used a dollar to wipe his nose. Is a dollar clean or dirty? Dirty. That's right. The dollar is dirty. So Marvin says you can have the dollar if you want. Do you want the dollar? No. And why? Be because he sneezed on it. <laughs> okay. So what do we conclude about object history? For young children, as for adults, object representations do seem to include invisible ties for their history. This affects attention, memory, valuation of objects. Uh, I think concepts of ownership are deeply rooted in object history from at least three years of age, possibly a bit younger than three. That's a bit controversial. Uh, but concepts of moral taint may require more specific cultural input, although there's like a hint that it might be coming in by five or six. Okay, so to conclude, um, children consider abstract and non-obvious features when they're reasoning both about kinds and individuals. They transcend the here and now. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize that this is so even for individuals, which are, you know, literally uh, in, in the here and now. Um, and I think this calls into question 
the idea that what we see is somehow more cognitively primitive uh, for children uh, by three years of age. And of course, if you think about all the wonderful talks we've heard over the past few days, you'll know that this is actually quite a familiar uh, conclusion because children have many abstract or non-obvious representations by two and a half or three. Clearly, they're reasoning about causality, mental states, number, morality, logical operators, absent entities, imaginary friends, and so on. So um, my view is that the standard developmental story is backwards, at least by the time we have language using uh, young people, uh, and that for them going beyond the obvious is easy, and that sticking with the here and now is actually challenging or can be challenging. That involves ignoring categorical information when it competes with individuating information or ignoring object history to evaluate items strictly on their objective merits. I think these are difficult. Um, and my, you know, the implications I want to end with, again, will seem familiar to you, I'm sure. Um, I'm, I'm sort of connecting this set of conclusions with uh, themes that have been well articulated by others, many in this room, over the uh, past number of years. Um, how we come to know the world, you know, if our representations of objects and kinds go beyond what is uh, present in the here and now, this uh, is consistent with the idea that knowledge is not just built up piecemeal or unidirectionally from sensory or perceptual observations, and that um, our concepts require learning from others, that the non-obvious concepts require social input because children cannot just rely on information from their own senses. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for the talk, it was great. Um, I would like to ask you, what do you think about representing object history in early infancy? Because uh, thinking about, for example, is, is stealing things, these are likely concepts that are not there yet. Right. So uh, it sounds to me that perhaps representing object history also relies on, on concepts that uh, infants might not have, so what would be to represent object history when these concepts are not available? Right. No, that's a great question, and part of the reason I was careful to say I'm talking about language using children, like by three or four, I mean, it's preverbal infants are, you know, a mysterious world to me. Um, uh, and even two-year-olds, it's not clear that they have uh, all of the concepts that I'm talking about here. I do think there's a sense in which maybe object history is really part of all of our, uh, even preconceptual representations, if, if we can call it that. Um, if you think of something like associative learning, that's attaching a history to something. Um, now it's you know it's far from the the kinds of um, richer uh, conceptual representations that I'm interested in, but uh, there's a sense in which you know you experience a, a set of shocks in combination with a certain you know entity in the world, and then that those shocks aren't there. Uh, but it still somehow retains traces of that history. So it may be something very, very fundamental to um, how any organism, you know, it's part of learning. It, it, it's, um, uh, I, I think those roots may be very, very basic. Hi, my question is generic. Ah. Um, not specific <laughs> to any studies. So if generics evolved for, um, to facilitate cultural transmission of knowledge, and yes. I think you agree with that, how can we um, uh, consolidate or how can we understand the interplay between interest and attention to something very specific like President Obama wears a pin to um, 
a conflicting generic statement, all dads wear a pin with a flag, and what would you predict would be more preferentially transmitted if it were to be transmitted to an ignorant font specific? Mm, okay. Um, interesting. Uh, I, I'm going to give a couple of different answers to that very interesting question. Um, one is, is sort of this point I made at the end, there's sometimes hard to ignore the kind representation. And um, I, I'm going to give you an anecdote from when my daughter was, uh, I can't remember exactly how old, I think about three and a half. And she was playing with these Duplo uh, little blocks. Uh, and one was a, a male figure and one was a female figure. And then she said to me, he's don't have eyelashes, only she's have eyelashes. And I thought that was ridiculous, but then I looked at the toys and, if, and in fact the, the girl one had these very visible eyelashes and the boy one had no eyelashes. So I got my husband into the room, I said, look at daddy, daddy's a he, look he has eyelashes. And she said, He's don't have eyelashes. <laughs> like she, the, the kind overrode the specific information. So I think there's always that, you know, I think it's, it's sort of like these are uh, two sets of principles that children can use. They can use the individuating information. They can use the kind information. Um, I wouldn't be able to pre predict at any moment which they'll use, but I don't think there's a clear ordering. I don't think it's a case that, uh, oh, you know, presented with the counterexample, the generic goes out the window. No, in fact, quite the opposite. I mean, that's one of the dangerous things about generics, that they are resistant to counter evidence because they have that um, looseness of interpretation. So if we were to make uh, categorical claims using universal quantifiers, if we said things like all uh, girls, uh, you know, where no boys have eyelashes or something like that. You only need one counterexample to prove that false. Um, but generics have that insidious quality where you can, uh, you know, kind of rack up the counterexamples and that doesn't negate the generalization. Um, I guess the other thing that I wanted to mention is that, um, of course, often, um, when children form these generic representations, it can be based on just a single individual. So uh, I have some studies with Amanda Brandoni where um, we presented adults and children with a single novel individual uh, and asked them to talk about it. And we found that they were very likely to form generics about these categories for which they had only a single instance. They actually knew nothing about uh, the you know, variability of this kind, but if it were, uh, particularly in certain domains, like if they were, if they were construed as animals as, as opposed to artifacts, then they would go from the individual to the generic. So I think there's that interplay uh, between specific and generic. Dan? <coughs> yeah, working, yeah. Uh, so, so thank you, very, first of all, for a very nice talk. Uh, um, the, the, the notion of generic as accepting counterexamples, up to 99%, uh, we, in the case of the uh, uh, vir Nile, Nile, West Nile virus, uh, uh, makes it a very strange, mysterious phenomena. Uh, uh, but there's another way to look at it, uh, uh, where they, they don't admit more of exception than any, anything else. And that the, the, the oddity is not in the way we think about kinds, but in the kind of properties we attribute to them, namely disposition ones. So a, a dog is a four-legged animal, but some dogs lose a leg or are born with three legs. Uh, uh, a, a dog who is, who is born with three legs is missing its four legs, so to speak. Now, if you build a table with uh, three legs, it's not missing its four legs. It's, uh, it, does, it doesn't have it as an essential property. So. Why not go for, you know, trade the mystery of acceptance of endless counterexamples for the interesting problems of what is being attributed are dispositional properties in some sense, which may be realized a, a lot, uh, 
uh, are, are very little. So if you think of, of a, sp a sperm, it, it's, uh, you might say it you know, will give life to, to uh, when it meets an egg, uh, uh, to a life. And we're not, not one in, in uh, a million sperm <laughs> does it, but it still yeah. is a, it's a, disposi it's a dispositional properties that they do have. I completely agree. I think that um, generics do express these dispositional qualities rather than, you know, actualizations in the world. Um, but uh, generics have this interesting property, which, uh, and Sandeep Prasada has talked about this, which, yes, they, they convey dispositions, but they can also be used to convey frequency. So if we say barns are red, it's not because barns have a disposition to be red, but rather this is conventionally the case. It's typically the case. So they can be used in both kinds. Let me see if I can find. I, uh, I was hoping somebody might ask me about um, <laughs> generics in that way. Uh, no, that's not it. Sorry. I'm going by these very... Um, minimal titles, so I, I may not be able to find it. But um, the point that I want to make is that I think, so if my, my, my take, okay, let's see. Sorry, I'm not used to doing this. My take is that generics are expressing properties that are relevant to the kind but there are multiple roots to a property being relevant to the kind. Um, okay, this, yes, okay. So, so um, I'll just take a minute to kind of go through this. So I talked about frequency, so the probability of a feature given the category, and this is where like mosquito, West Nile virus for mosquitoes, or your example of sperm, very, very low. Some people then say, well, maybe you're looking at the wrong kind of frequency. What about distinctiveness? Uh, there's some evidence that if a property is more distinctive, that that may contribute to it being uh, making a good generic. Um, so the probability that something that carries West Nile virus is a mosquito is actually high. So on that probability, um, this, this could account for that. But that's insufficient, too, because we have non-distinctive properties. Lions eat meat, dogs are four-legged, cats have good hearing. Uh, those aren't special to lions or dogs or cats, but they're good generics. Then there are statements that are infrequent and non-distinctive, like ducks lay eggs. A lot of different animals lay eggs. Goats produce milk. Peacocks are colorful. Um, and then, of course, we have the frequent and distinctive but poor generics, like the ones that I talked about. And this is why I think that what's going on is conceptual centrality is key. Um, and I think it can be cued by a number of different, I think we're flexible in terms of what could count. So uh, prevalence, like the Barnes are red, distinctiveness, like the West Nile virus, uh, beliefs about feature distributions, Tesla and Goodman have a beautiful model that accounts for a lot of data. Uh, Sarah Jane Leslie has talked about danger or harm or threat as, as making a property more conceptually central. Um, and biological folk theories, which includes um, your, my last point is uh, this one about predispositions, which we find good evidence for as well. So I'm in agreement with you, but I don't think that accounts for all generics. Okay, the last question. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, I have a quick question about the connection between generics and language. Uh, generics are grammatically, systematically distinct across languages in different ways, mm. subject to some linguistic differences, but um, nonetheless, there's systematic grammatical differences, as in, in your example of are the elephants small or are elephants small, so determiners make all of the difference. Right. And um, indeed, the grammar seems to be simpler in the case of generics. So in fact, you would predict yes. from that that cognition, if it's an aspect or 
integrated with language development would have generics early because it's yes. an early form of reference. So I'm wondering how your story is, uh, how, how language is woven into your conceptual story. Yes, so uh, I'll tell you what I think. You can tell me if I'm not answering your question. I, I think that's a really interesting and important observation. Generics tend to be linguistically unmarked. So uh, this is one of the reasons we're interested in Quechua. Quechua is an agglutinative language uh, where it has like root words and then you add on these various markers that can tell you about all kinds of specific things that situate a concept in a time or place. And um, it w how do you form a generic? You, you strip away everything specific. And I think that's not just a coincidence that different languages tend to do that, um, but also I think that I think that is parallel to what's going on with, in development. I think um, if children's task were to find like markers of genericity, um, that would be so difficult, so complex, so hard to even figure out because. You know, sometimes, like in English, sometimes it's a, uh, sometimes it's the, sometimes it's plural, sometimes it's singular, um, and so forth. But if a child assumes that if I don't get anything specific, I can interpret this as generic, it really solves the problem. So um, I, it, how could it be specific? It could be specific because you're putting tense on the verb. It could be specific because you're putting aspect on the verb. It could be specific because you're using um, a demonstrative like this. It could be specific because you um, do it with your intonation. You know, like you, you make it, uh, the dog, you know, this dog or something like that. Or by pointing or by saying yesterday or by saying my or like the, the word, you know, there's a world of opportunity to make something specific. Um, and so when there's no specificity, and that's partly why we did the study of gesturing, parental gesturing, that avoidance of giving specific information uh, allows a child, I think, to reach a generic interpretation more readily. So I think that's very much built in, the acquisition piece is very much built in to the linguistic analysis of what's going on. Okay, thank you, Susan.